to get us going here, let's let's have a, a, an initial overview of fisheries. We have there's there's many dimensions this we have to talk about in the in the you know coming lectures, but but for now let's just talk uh, generally speaking about um, what we mean by f by fisheries. So we have this term fishery that is commonly thrown around. What does that mean? So there's a couple things that the, that fishery can refer to. It can refer to the resource itself, the fish in the ocean. That can be what we mean when we say fishery. It could mean the area where that organism or those organisms live. So this intertidal, this rocky reef, that kind of thing. It could also include the people who are doing the fishing. In fact, all of these things together comprise the, the overall fishery, even though we sometimes classically just think of it as the biological organism. Uh, some terms that I uh, want you guys to just be aware of um, in terms of modern uh, managing of, of fisheries. Um, we have a lot of regulations built around the, the conservation and the management of these organisms. And from that, from that policy comes different terms. First one is stock. So stock is a term that you and I would probably call the population. But the stock is the amount of of individuals and or biomass in that particular area. So that stock is, the, is essentially the population. The fishery is a term we use for anything we're harvesting. It could be algae, it could be invertebrates, it could be lobster, or it could be an actual you know, cartilaginous fish or bony fish or something of that nature. Right? So fishery in this context doesn't just mean a vertebrate. The data that we will be using and that people use overall to talk about the status of fisheries, um, we'll get that data from two main places. There's, there's other stuff we might get here and there, but, but by and large, the main sources of data for the US are NOAA, and specifically NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service. We used to call that NIMFS as an, as an acronym, and then for a, a decade or so ago, they they decided they didn't like that term. They wanted us to only call them NOAA fisheries, and that sort of is kind of fails. So sometimes people will say NIMS, sometimes they'll say NOAA fisheries, but it all comes from NOAA, US data. And then uh, for the world, the go-to place is the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization based in Rome. They do all the food stuff, but there's a, there's a, a, a division that handles um, seafood and, 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 and fish-related uh, stuff. So that's where we get stuff. Um, modern fisheries management is about regulating and conserving a, an exploited resource, a harvested resource. And much of what we work on is, um, in addition to doing that, making sure the places where those critters live um, are also managed, protective, protected, and conserved. <clears throat> this is uh, the face of modern fisheries. So this is uh, the largest fish market in the world and has been the largest fish market in the world for decades, if not centuries. This is the Tsukiji fish market in Tokyo. And this is where just about all of your high-end sushi comes from, um, at, at least on the west coast of the US. Um, and so we're looking here, our harvested tuna, they're flash frozen as they're caught, put on the boat, the boat pulls up, dumps them, at, dumps them right here on, on the fish market and people bid on them and go for it. Um, I've taken your predecessors to the, the biggest thing we have in the U.S. that's equivalent to that, and that's the Honolulu fish market. So I'll play you um, a little bit of the video from that uh, uh, class trip we took to Hawaii a few years ago. Maybe it's a little hard to hear that sound. Okay, so, so we're at this place. It's early in the morning. These guys are offloading fish, right? So, that, so you see these big chunks of fish that are coming off. These are flash frozen tunas. They're coming in. They're going to go on this crate. That crate, they're going to ride into a chilled warehouse behind me. This is right near the um, airport. So this stuff can also be exported across the US and the world. And so here's, this, here's the, the freshly caught fish. Uh, they're on ice. Um, and now we're in the main, and now we're going to walk into the main uh, floor of the um, fish auction house as a mahi-mahi or, or dorado. Um, 
Uh, I obviously spliced together some video because this, this looks like the sun is up. So this is, this is a bit uh, old. Okay, so now, now we're inside the, the um, auction house. And so this is nonstop for several hours, people wheeling in, big pallet of fish, dump it off, and then the bidders walk around. And it's like, they're gonna look at the quality of the fish, quality of the meat, and they're gonna be bidding on it. And a lot of them are on cell phones, on their cell phones to the restaurants in Tokyo, to the buyers in New York, whatever. And they're saying, okay, right today, that's going for $5 a pound. Today, that quality is going for $6.95 a pound or whatever. So they're walking down, this guy's calling, 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 and the bidder is, is making a, a statement. And then when they bid, they put the, the, the successful bidder's name on it, slap it on, and it's gone. So this is thousands and thousands and thousands of individual fish. One of these large tuna, can go for many tens of thousands of dollars, um, depending on the, the weight and the quality and all that kind of stuff. And so what they've, what they've done here is they've, they've sliced out a chunk of it and the buyer is feeling for oil, quality, if there's any burn, which means that the fish was fighting really hard and it, it makes the uh, flesh taste more meatier. But, but this is the face of modern um, fishery management. Brandon. This is open to the public. This is open to the public. So, I mean, uh, they don't want just random people walking in here, so you, you, can go, you can sign up for a tour. So now it's run by a nonprofit. So but yeah. People buying. Oh, oh, uh, you have to be approved, an approved buyer. So you, 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 you could go through the process. process. Okay. Yeah, so most people are buying for like large scale. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're a restaurant owner in Honolulu, you can go in and, you know, buy a fish. But most of the people here are buying to then throw this on an airplane to go immediately to Chicago, to go to Miami, to go to wherever. And this is, again, this is, you know, tens of thousands of fish all day long. Do, 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 do. And so this is for the high end market. So this is for highly valuable fish, tunas, um, um, that type of stuff. Um, more typically, when we buy in bulk, we buy a large lot of fish and you're subsampling. In this case, the stuff is so high quality, so valuable that they're actually, the, the buyers are actually feeling each individual fish and they're, and they're making an estimate based on that individual fish. So these are these guys' whole job, this is all they do, right? This is, this is their, they're experts at this, they've been doing this for decades kind of thing. And so you see the guy uh, do, doing the auction house and he's calling, okay, this guy got that bid, this guy got that bid, blah, 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 blah. So it's, it's very much so like the stock market, like when you see those old videos of the stock market before we had electronic trading, and be like, hey, they could buy, sell, buy, like that kind of stuff, right? Although here they're only buying. Okay, cool. Okay. Most of the seafood that we're getting from the ocean comes from the near shore environment, meaning, meaning that, that stuff that's on the, uh, you know, proximate to the, to the land um, before we get into the deep sea. Why? You guys probably know this, but we have upwellings in this area. It tends to be nutrient rich, tends to be high light, so a lot of productivity. So we have a lot of um, uh, primary productivity. Um, again, this is happening over the continental shelves. Um, also, these nearshore areas tend to be close to estuaries, which are, which are not for every single species, but for many species, especially invertebrates, they're really important nursery habitats. And, but also for certain fish species, in particular some, the flat fishes and things of that nature. Um, so here is a bit of a terrestrial and aquatic um, a trophic structure, right? Um, when we harvest seafood, we're mostly harvesting the, the, the predators, the, 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 the higher trophic level critters. We tend to not, on average, get the herbivores and the grazers and things of that nature. Um, and so, uh, for example, if we take the, the North Atlantic, um, uh, sort of New England type area. What we see is the most commonly exploited species uh, in terms of numbers, in terms of uh, dollar value. It's things like the uh, cod and herring, and those tend to be pretty high on the trophic, um, uh, on, on the measure of trophic levels, right? So again, we're not taking the herbivores, we're taking the top carnivores and the things. Same thing on our, on our coast. Um, Important to say that we've, we've changed these systems quite a lot, right? So these systems before we were in the picture, um, there were uh, apex predators in our, in our, on our coastline, things like sea otters, things like sheephead, um, and we now dominate that. So we now dominate, and we've dominated that for a long time. 
This is not a modern phenomenon. This is a human phenomenon. Let me, re let me restate that. This is not an American phenomenon. This is not a 20th century thing. Humans, whenever we've gone to these coastal systems, we pretty quickly become the, the top predator, whether it was 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or now. We're doing it more devastatingly right now, but this phenomenon of we enter a system, we become the top dog, that has been going on for a long time. Caleb. I mean, the sheep eat, right? Yep. Totally. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah. So just, just rem as, a, as a reminder here, um, you know, it's, it's not exactly correct, but, but the, the rule that you sometimes see in your introductory textbooks, we talk about 10% efficiency, totally made up. But the idea is that, that, um, that uh, a fraction of uh, the biomass actually goes from one trophic level to the next, right? Energetically, it takes a lot of, a lot of, a, lot, a big base down here to make the next level of the pyramid. And that take, a lot of that energy goes into making a smaller upper level and, and as we go on, as we build towards this so-called pyramid um, of uh, biomass, and we tend to attack these things, right? So, so for that biomass, for us to eat that fish, let's say that tuna or whatever, that tuna in turn had to eat a bunch of other fish, which had to eat a bunch of other fish on average and a bunch of other fish. Um, we often will characterize a fishery by its habitat. So for example, we'll talk about bottom dwellers. These would be fish that tend to be pretty tightly associated with the benthos. Um, or we can talk about things like pelagic fisheries, open water fisheries, wide open in the, in the big ocean types of fisheries. Historically, so this is, I'd say this is the modern view, modern meaning post-World War II view. Um, that, uh, uh, I'll read the quote. So until recently, in the balance between productivity of fish populations, which again we would call a stock in modern language, and people's ability to catch those fish, the fish were favored. That's no longer the case. We are now totally able to find just about every morsel of, of, of fish out there using our technology, using our capabilities, using our, our fossil-fueled fleets and sensors and all that kind of stuff. And so what we tend to see is we tend to see this is sort of a, a um, a cartoon uh, version of this, but we tend to see, so right here, this is the percent of the fisheries, right? So this would be a totally intact pre-exploitation level on the upper part of this axis and, and totally extinct on the bottom. And this is a sort of a generic timeline here, right? Going from back in the day to more modern times. And the, initially, when we start off, much of the, um, and, and again, this is the parlance that got us into this problem, right? So we looked at this and we said, ah, that's a so-called wasted or underexploited species. So that's bad, right, in, in this sort of economics language. So we don't want to waste, we don't want to underexploit things. So the first phase is considered undeveloped. So we either haven't exploited those, those we haven't harvested those, that fishery very much, or we don't know how or don't have the technological ability to harvest that species. Then we get into, okay, now we're starting to figure out where they are. Okay, now I got it. Now I sort of get, get, the, get the vibe of things. Okay, yeah, now I'm gonna start to, um, to, to um, you know, make a profit on this and do that kind of stuff. Mature, in the language of, of you know, fisheries economics, Mature is that, hey, we're pulling them off at the ideal rate. We're, 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 we're landing fish at, at, a good, at a good clip. And then senescent, we would call over-harvested or extinct or dying or whatever. Okay, as of uh, the most recent global assessment, 60% of the world's fish stocks are so-called fully exploited, meaning we're getting as much of that biomass out as we can. And 30% are overexploited or depleted. More on that in a second. So the key thing there is about two thirds maximally used, about a third we use them too much, right? Um, many uh, and so and so this idea even more generically is that many of these fisheries um, around the world are overexploited, are, are are harvested too much, um, and. 
almost none have the potential to expand. Almost none of our wild caught fisheries um, can we just sort of, oh, we just need to get better and figure out where they are or figure out the right fishing method. That, that's not really the case. Large predatory fish, things like sharks and, and the like, um, those folks have, those individuals have declined by about 90%, conservatively probably about, about 90% glo globally speaking. So we've had a huge impact on our uh, world out here. In the U.S., we're faring a bit better. Uh, about a fifth of our fish stocks are so-called overexploited. So essentially what we've mostly done in places like California is we've stopped our fishing so that, that's good for the fish stocks. And then we just eat our fish from other places that don't manage their fisheries very well. Yeah. That's the general story. OK, so let's talk a little bit about this idea of overfishing and overfished. These are policy terms. And so here I'm using the NOAA, NOAA terminology, the US federal regulator terminology. Key idea here is MSY, or maximum sustainable yield. That is, I'll show you, I'll show you uh, what, that, what that means in a second. But, but uh, conceptually, what that means is the largest long-term average catch we can take from a stock, um, given the current conditions, um, that won't harm the, the, the long-term productivity of that, of that uh, fish stock. Overfishing is when we, we are taking stuff at a rate that's beyond that, that so-called sustainability rate, right? So overfishing is when we're harvesting above the MSY. That's overfishing. We say a stock is overfished when it's gotten, when we've, we've, we've over, something is overfished when we've been doing overfishing for a while, right? So now it's knocked down, and not only is it knocked down, but it's having a hard time recovering, right? So overfishing is the initial sort of action of doing it. And then once we see the, the result of that, that's an overfished resource or an overfished stock. Or, an, or we can also use the term overharvested. Um, OK. Uh, and then rebuilding is when we have a stock that we've either stopped harvesting or reduced our harvest. And it's essentially we're, we're, we're wanting the numbers, the biomass, to go up to get to a point where we can get back to quote unquote fishing it like normal. Right? Okay, so MSY, overfishing, overfished, and then rebuilding are key policy terms in terms of fisheries management um, for US policy. So let's talk about, uh, just for a second, uh, in a cartoon fashion, what we mean by MSY. This is what we mean. Okay, so on this axis right here, we have fishing effort. Okay, now this could be the number of days, this could be the number of people, this is, could be the be the number of hours, whatever. It's whatever the relative measure of effort. It could be the number of traps, the number of lobster traps that we set out in this bay. And it's going to go from none or low to a lot or high. On the y-axis here, we have the yield. And this is important. This, this, this um, axis is the yield per cost, right? So, so the yield, right? So the, the amount we get out. So here we go. So uh, this line is fishing costs. So generally speaking, as we, as we fish more, we, things are going to cost more, right? We've got to buy another trap, got to buy another boat, got to buy another, pay the labor for another, another crew deckhand or whatever, okay? So that's going to go up. As, as fishing effort goes up, the cost is going to go up. Um, and then this guy right here is the yield curve. This green thing is the yield curve. So this should look a lot like your environmental economics class, because that's what this stuff comes from. It comes from the ec economic thinking, not, not, uh, not ecological thinking. Mm -hmm. OK, so what is MSY? OK, so, so you know, we're going to have a lot of yield, a lot of yield, a lot of yield, a lot of yield. Then, then eventually, we're going to start to you know, take a lot of stuff and impact how much stuff we can get. And so then it'll eventually start to decline. Once this goes below, uh, uh, below this, this is the level of fishing that would happen if we have no regulation. So this is the point at which you're spending money and you're not making any more money. So you're going to tend to stop there. That's not how many fisheries work on the planet. We subsidize massively most many fisheries around the planet. China, uh, Indonesia, uh, Russia, uh, huge subsidies that don't make any financial sense, let alone ecological sense, 
But so that, that can drive this over here to the right. So that can drive, that means the yield, that means we're, we're losing money by fishing, right? Um, the the um, maximum economic yield is going to be this guy, where the difference between the top of this curve and this cost is the largest gap, right? So, so that's going to be the best economic bang for the buck. Um, the best sort of uh, for, uh, you know, resource, uh, the amount of, amount of protein going into people's mouths, that maximum sustainable yield is going to be a little bit to the right of that, and that's the so-called MSY. So this, is, this, this would tell us, ah, this is the rate. Can you guys think of any, I mean, there's, there's several possible problems, but can you guys think of a, a, any key problems with an, a, taking this approach to managing a, a resource? Okay, good. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's, so, so, so these things are being represented as a fixed line. Yeah. They can be dynamic. Good. Uh huh. Yeah. Good. Anything else? So variation. Right. Right. So this is incredibly dangerous, right? So this is, this lulls us into thinking that we're smarter than we are. That, oh, look, the model says this. The, my estimate says that. Um, we don't actually know, in most cases, how many fish are out there, right? We're, we're, just, we're, we're going off of the, the pro productivity of the fishery. We're not going off of the actual how many individuals are out in the ocean. So what this can do, by, by, by making our decisions based on this, when we, just like Julia is saying, if we have an El Nino, if we had a bad recruitment year, if we had a, a disease outbreak and the population goes lower, we don't see that, right? We just keep harvesting because we think, oh yeah, okay, it's And so this is this very easy taking this, this traditional approach to over exploit the resource, to overshoot the MSY. And then, then now, oh my gosh, now we have fewer fish, but hey, I got a boat. I got to pay for my kids' college education. I got to pay for my boat payments. How's that going to work? Well, I just better keep fishing and hope it gets better. And, and right, we get in this, this cycle of overexploitation. And then, and then the next year, the stock gets knocked down even lower and then lower and then lower. So, so this is sort of a theoretical basis. It doesn't necessarily respond to the real world conditions, be that environmental variation, be that recruitment variation, be that uh, what have you. So as a consequence, by using this approach, we've driven many um, species uh, to very low levels, right? Or problematic levels. And so the general term for this is fishery collapse. And this is the classic picture. So this is illustrated with Atlantic cod. Atlantic cod, the thing that really drove, folk, one of the main things that drove Europeans to North America, right? Yes, we hear about religious freedom and all this kind of stuff. That's mostly BS, right? The real and original driver was folks following these fish stocks. And cod and, th and this, this, this type of fish were incredibly important, particularly before we had refrigeration, very abundant. And so we'd salt these, salt these fish and they would be preserved and it was like jerky and it was, it was portable protein. So, so we were, folks originally tracked to North America, um, especially New England area, tracking these um, the, the, this food resource. And so we've been fishing this resource in, in, as sort of you know, Western people for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And here we go. So now we're entering, so the 1800s, okay, so we, and this is how many we caught that particular year, okay? Okay, so some years is up, some years down, it's like a biological resource, right? So everything is, there's always fluctuation, there's always weather and things, but basically it's sort of about this level. <laughs> Up, down, up, down. Some years better, some years worse. And then we hit World War II. World War II, we don't do much fishing because everybody's busy killing each other. So we don't have as many ships or time to go in the ocean. So there's usually, so by and large, we, we had a reduced amount of harvest pressure in the immediate time frame of World War II. But then in the wake of World War II, all this fantastic technology we invented to slaughter each other. Um, things like efficient engines, things like radar, things like sonar, all that kind of stuff come into play. 
and we start turning that onto our fisheries. So then we start to see this, oh, okay, we start to get bigger, bigger, and then all, and then all of a sudden, and people are like, whoa, this is so good, we've never had such a great thing. And, what, and this looks good, right, from the, from the bank sheet, from the tally sheet, but the biological, this, again, let me emphasize, this is not the population size in the wild. This is what we see as fisheries managers. This is the stuff that comes to the dock at the end of the day. And so, oh my God, it's great. And then all of a sudden, wait, what's going on? Collapse, 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 collapse. And there's a little teeny bit of burp. People are like, oh, see, it's all fine. And then boom, it crashes, right? So that story has played out in many different species. Atlantic cod, Atlantic salmon, sardines, um, halibut, anchovies. And it, the list goes on and on and on and on, right? This notion of fishery collapse. All of a sudden, there are just is not that biomass. And we're still using the, the nets. We're still using our boats. We're still using our hooks. But it's just not catching fish. Caleb. I'm like off topic, but like the cod, now there's like this stuff that I probably don't want to eat. Like, 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 I think it's like farm cod. I'm not sure. But like a bunch of like healthy fish that don't cod and stuff. I don't know. Cod, cod, cod forms the basis of much of what, when you guys go to your restaurant and get your fish tacos, when you go to the, to whatever, uh, McDonald's and get your, your, your uh, uh, filet of fish when you go to the freezer section, the, the, that and that, and that sister species form most of that. So that, that's the bulk of what we are eating, at least in our country. Um, okay. So uh, why do we have these declines? A bunch of reasons. Here's some quick ones before we, before we wrap up for the day. Um, one is overfishing, right? Which is taking too many individuals. And overfishing is both the stuff that we take to eat and the stuff that in the practice of our doing of fishing uh, leads to the death of critters. And so the general term for that is bycatch. And so, so that amount of stuff is greater than the population can reproduce. Somebody had, Vivian had a question. No. Oh, you just started. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the other, another, the next key thing as to why we have this problem of, of declining fish stocks is, um, is we're too good, right? We're too good at what we do. We're, we're too efficient with our technologies. Examples include the fishing vessel itself, the types of materials we put in the water to, to, to capture the individuals, radar and sonar to locate the actual biomass, the bodies of the individuals, electronic navigation. So sat GPS driven, uh, I know exactly where the sea mount is now because I can park my vessel right over. Even though I'm in the middle of the ocean, I know exactly where I am. Um, and then increasingly things like aircraft, satellites, that are, so, so a lot of these guys that are hunting tuna, they have a real-time feed from a, a NOAA weather satellite or an equivalent satellite. And they're looking for the productivity fronts. They're looking for the chlorophyll in the ocean. They drive right up to there, and that's where they fish. So you have satellites tracking these species, right? And then you have these industrial fit ships following along and doing the processing, the harvesting. These populations don't really stand much of a chance. Um, OK, another key term, bycatch. So bycatch, again, as I mentioned, is the capture of, of individuals we're not going to eat. Individuals we're not trying to catch. They just sort of incidentally get caught up. Um, we can also talk about overcapacity. This is what I was referencing a little bit earlier, saying that we've been put all this, um, co various countries put a huge amount of financial uh, uh, resources behind their fishing fleets for political reasons, for other reasons. And so that leads to fishing fleets, generally speaking, being larger than necessary to get the, um, the, the sustainable catch or the, the legally allowed catch, um, as it were. <clears throat> what happens, you guys probably know this, but, um, but examples of when we do do this overharvesting, what can happen? Um, a couple ideas. First one, fishing down the food web. Second, habitat degradation, just the, the trawling itself or the fishing itself might break the coral or break the damage, the benthos, that kind of thing. Trophic cascades, so altered abundances of populations. Um, and then ultimately we can see changes in life history traits. So let's look at those real quick. So fishing down the, the, the food webs, this was first introduced by this crew from, um, uh, from Canada, uh, Daniel Pauly and his group and his colleagues. But basically the idea is we start off with the shark. We start off on the upper left and we take those things. And then once we deplete that, then we switch to something else. Then we switch to the next biggest thing. Then when we take that off, the next biggest thing, the next biggest thing, the next biggest thing. So ultimately, where we're headed now is people fishing um, jellyfish 
and people fishing shrimp, you know, planktonic shrimp, euphousid shrimp, and things of that nature. Um, what does that habitat degradation look like? This is, these are some sites off of Florida. These are deep sea coral here. And we see a healthy site before we did anything, uh, these oculina reefs, uh, is, is, you know, lots of big fish and little nooks and crannies where critters are in, all that kind of good stuff. Once we've dragged nets and physically pulled structures over the bottom, we can actually, you know, in some cases, these are very delicate structures like these corals, and we break them. And so after fishing is gone, it looks like this, right? Very few little nooks and crannies where fish can ha hide out in, re take refuge, um, and all of this and that. Uh, and we see this with other uh, deep sea uh, critters as well. Again, uh, before trawling on the left, after trawling on the right. Next, we can see trophic cascades. So again, that is where um, we influence one critter, and then by influencing that critter, we indirectly influence the, the other members in that ecosystem that are being influenced by that critter. So for example, let's say we, let's say we take out this tuna. Well, so this apex fish, now the, the fish that this guy would be eating, all of a sudden they have less predation pressure. So maybe that fish gets, gets, becomes more abundant. Okay, and then that fish becomes more abundant, but then the thing that it eats becomes rarer and, and so on and so forth. So that trophic cascade um, is, a, is a domino-like effect that can happen um, when we uh, uh, exploit species uh, too much. And then um, the last uh, one here is a, is a change in life history traits. And most typically, we, most classically, we see this with females um, starting to become um, sexually mature younger and spawning at younger ages. So rather than doing it when they were, I don't know, three years old, they do it when they're two years old. Or rather than do it when they're two years old, they do it when they're one and a half, that kind of thing. And so that's, an evolu that's, a, that's a strong evolutionary pressure to reproduce more quickly and, and, and as soon as you can because you aren't going to be around um, as long as your um, you know, historic members of your species were around. Um, uh, and this is, this is a problem because um, one of the most important things we found are these so-called uh, boffin or big old fat females or big old fat fish, um, they have a, a disproportionate impact on the population dynamics of many of our fisheries because it's not as if a fish that's twice as big is gonna make twice as many eggs. It's usually exponentially related to that. Now, the males, sperm tends to be cheap. Sperm tends to be you know, easy to make, right? Eggs are much more energetically costly. And eggs take a lot more time to take up more space, all that kind of stuff. So, so we see, um, in particular, protecting these large females, fecund females, as, as a key uh, thing that is a good idea to do. But oftentimes, they get exploited during um, fish, fishing because they're big fish and they have a lot of you know, meat on them. And so attacking those larger individuals are one of the, is one of the key things that drives these change, uh, change life history traits. And so overall, all this stuff is happening at the same time. We have, we have bycatch, we have, we have over, over capacity, all this stuff to, um, uh, comes together and causes us some problems. And so um, we'll talk about more in the, in the upcoming lectures about more details with this stuff, but I want to just frame us with that. So, um, so also next week, we'll start working on our um, uh, our assignments and our targets and how we're going to go about uh, going to individual uh, points of sales and seeing what seafood is being provided. And our, oper our op overall operating question for this next module is going to be, if I want to purchase seafood responsibly, if I want to encourage the most sustainable uh, types of practices, can I? Right now, when you guys go out to have lunch today or go to the market to buy some food for dinner tonight, can you make an informed decision? Um, uh, based on, on what's offered to you. So that, that's going to be our operate, operating thing. So in the next few weeks, we'll go into more depth on fisheries. We'll go into all diff different variations and that kind of good stuff. And we'll be collecting some data on our own. Um,